and welcome to Book Solid. I'm your host, Soraya, and today I'm joined by fellow bookstagrammer Liz, who you can find on Instagram at another reader account, and we're going to be discussing Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. Spoiler alert! Hey guys, just as a heads up, we will be revealing spoilers in this episode. If you haven't yet read the book or seen the show or film, this is a courteous reminder to proceed with caution. Liz, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So before we jump in, if you want to tell people a little bit about your bookstagram and the kind of content you create. Yeah. So my name's Liz, but my bookstagram account is um, at another reader account. And basically, uh, it's just a really like full of different types of books. I like thrillers, romance, um, a little bit of uh, nonfiction and memoirs. Haven't gotten to fantasy just yet, but it's really just me posting uh, whatever I'm reading and whatever I'm into. Um, so it's been a great way to pass time during the pandemic as well. Yeah, wait, I definitely feel that. That's the pandemic birthed <laughs> book solid as well. So if there's ever a time to like seek comfort from books. I feel like these past few years were. Yes. In. Oh my gosh. Yes. Disappearing into a book was just everything. Like, yes. definitely what I needed. And meeting people like you on Bookstagram has been amazing. So I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. Like, I don't know how I really didn't know much about the Bookstagram community until creating the podcast. And I was like, this is the like least toxic, most comforting social media I've ever seen. Yes. I've never been so excited to like look at my stories and just like be able to just chill out and talk about books and and life in such a nice, calming, cool way. And like, it's really cool actually to like meet different people across the globe as well, like through Bookstagram. So that's been really fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. So today y'all know by the title, I'm sure, but we're going to be discussing Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. And I'm really excited because I was so tardy to the party on this book. And so I finally, finally had a reason to read it when we were recording this. Um, So I'll let you go ahead and what are your thoughts on the book? Oh my gosh, so many thoughts. I mean, first of all, I just have to say that because this was everywhere on Bookstagram, honestly, I started to kind of avoid the book because, you know, some of those really popular books, they might not be great. But once I finally, I am very much an audiobook lover, so I encourage everyone to get the audio on this. Um, and I thought this was the most sensual, beautiful, intense romance. And it was, I love the way how Tia wrote, like, it was almost like you were just talking to your best friend reading through all of this. Um, and it was really intense, surprisingly. So definitely like recommend this book a lot. Um, but yeah, it was definitely different from the other romance books. It wasn't your typical structure, boy meets girl or whatever. Like there's so many hidden gems in there and just like learning their background, the stories, Eva's and Shane's and how complex and complicated everything is. I mean, real life is complicated and love is too, but theirs was just like, I don't even know if they should be together. Like that's how it kind of ended up feeling to me. Like, wow, this is a lot. I have no idea how real people would handle this, but yeah. I completely agree. Like when I see a book blowing up like that, it makes me hesitant to read it just because I feel like oftentimes books or movies, they never end up living up to the hype for me. Like when everyone's just like, it's amazing. It's amazing. I feel like I go in, expectations are way too high and then I can never meet them and I'm just disappointed. (laughs) Um, But this one really did. And like you said, it it is so intense. And I wasn't like, I heard romance and was thinking it was going to be like a light, I don't want to say beachy read, but like, you know, just something like kind of light and romantic and, that's just not at all what this is. And I actually really appreciate that because like you said, life is complicated and you know, there is a time and a place for a light romantic beach read, but I love seeing really complex flawed characters Mm -hmm. and I feel like they're written so well and like going on this journey with them. And I know we'll get into this later, like as we keep talking, but I love that. I feel like sometimes in romance books, people treat their partner significant other like they're there to fix them Mm -hmm. or heal them Mm -hmm. and i feel like in this book they did a lot of healing on their own and then came together and i really liked that and i just i feel like that is also more like we should be pushing for more of that in in literature or any kind of 
um, media just because like I, I think that idea of like finding your soulmate and they're gonna patch you up and you need them to survive is like kind of a I don't want to say dangerous mentality but it's it, it can be kind of toxic yeah. and like you were saying like wondering should do should they even be together I wrote in my notes like as teenagers like them being separated the circumstances in which it happened were horrible but them being separated was probably the best thing that could have happened to them yeah because they absolutely. were on a dangerous path um So, yeah, I wanted to, I guess I'll just start with, like, the first thing in my notes, which was Eva's condition, Mm. um, like, her chronic headaches or migraines. Um, I thought that was written really, really well throughout the book. And I have not read many books where the protagonist suffers from chronic pain. And I just feel like the way that Tia wrote it in made because I think a lot of people write off chronic pain because they don't understand it or if it's not happening to them they don't realize how debilitating it can be or how like all-encompassing it is in your life and so I just I don't know I appreciated her putting that in as part of Eva's character and kind of showing the readers what it can be like to have to deal with something like that on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. And I was actually um, in a book club where Tia Williams kind of visited us really quickly. And she said she like also suffers from like migraines and stuff. So it was very real for her and, you know, her being able to like actually give this character, you know, a more fleshed out um, type of persona. Like, yeah, she has chronic migraines, but like it's, more intense than that. It affects all of her life from, you know, her being less open in relationships to, you know, not wanting to go out and, you know, be social or like how hard it is for her Mm -hmm. to actually be around people and even to be a mother, like how chronic this pain is. And I think, like you were saying earlier, like a lot of romance books are very, you know, light and fluffy and I, I kind of thought of it as, as Disney-fied. A lot of romance books are like, this is cute, you love it, but there's not any real conflict or anything within the characters. And this book yeah. is complete opposite of that. And just starting with like learning about Eva and what's ailing her and holds her back from so much in life um, was really interesting to get into, um, especially since I'm not, you know, thankfully, knock on wood, uh, not one who suffers from migraines. So like being able to really feel for her you know, um, and just it really made me root for her because to experience something like that debilitating and still, her, you know, trying to be successful author and a single mother. I mean, like props to this character. <laughs> yes. Like getting up every day and just like being a human. Like, I feel like it mm-hmm. was crazy because it put into perspective so many things that I think a lot of us like people who aren't suffering from chronic pain take for granted Yes, being able to get up and go have lunch with your friends, being able to, you know, complete the work you need to do for the day, go write something, go to the grocery store, taking care of your child, you know, like the fact that she has to push through and power through that immense pain every day just to do like the daily tasks of being a human. Yeah. I I couldn't even imagine. And, um, Oh my gosh, that line broke my heart when she was talking about her ex-husband when he was like, I, I wanted a wife, not a patient. Oh my God. That was terrible. That was, but so real because I think so many people go through such hard things, relationships all the time. And this guy, he seemed like the perfect, like honestly, the Disney prince, right? Like he had everything going together. He was um, complicated, not into fighting and everything. And she was just like, this is no, this is real life for me. And this is how painful it is for me to go through things. And she can't just wake up and be perfect looking, you know, like she, Mm -hmm. you know, she was getting sick all the time and, you know, having to do shots to mitigate the pain and him just being like, I can't accept how horrible this is, you know, like he couldn't even sugarcoat it. It was just, it was sad. And it's it's kind of like, (sighs) I understand how, why Eva shut herself off to love after that, because obviously no one wants to show their worst selves, but you do want someone to be there for you in your worst moments. And I feel like if you have a partner like that, you know, that's what you signed up for, you know, and you're, you're supposed to try to get through it together. And that was wild. I really had, I really was glad that he wasn't written too much more into the story after that. Like, okay, he's a great dad. And we send him, send um, Audrey off to California land or what'd she call it? Dad land. Dada, Dada Fornia. Dada Fornia. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's party time. Happiness is cool. But I don't need to talk any more about him. Like, I'm glad that he was he he was good for um, Eva 
when she needed uncomplicated in her life. And we got Audrey out of it, which I think she's a fan <laughs> favorite, honestly. So, yeah. She really was. Yeah, because I was like, um, I don't know how we're supposed to forgive him after that comment. So please don't be working him into the story that much. Right. Like, oh, that was... Yeah, that was it's also real because I'm sure there's so many people who like want to be there for other people, but sometimes it's just too hard. And in a way, you might say like, you know what, maybe that was the best choice he made for himself, too, because you Mm -hmm. also don't want a partner who's just not in it 100 percent with you. And it's just checked out. Like, I feel like that's also kind of a horrible thing to just stay in a relationship and be stuck you know? Like they're just they're out of obligation, yeah, because that was his wife and not because he like genuinely wanted to care for her. Yeah. Exactly, and I feel like with how observant Audrey is, she would have called them both out on that. Like, <laughs> are you guys like seriously going to stick together? Like, let me just psychoanalyze both of you. You suck together. Get divorced, please. Like. <laughs> Audrey, okay, we can talk about her for a little bit because I feel like the the role of or like the character of like a, pr- mm-hmm. a precocious child can be written in a way that's really like kind of contrived or like unoriginal. Like I feel like the, that that is a type of character that can very easily just be like kind of unrealistic. But she was written perfectly. She's so endearing, so charming, so funny, and was just like the perfect. Kind of, I don't want to call her comedic relief because she was more than that. Yeah. But she, she was just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> she really was, just like in every way. I mean, and yeah, she was a little bit of lighthearted relief that we needed because this book again is just so intense at times, and so being able to have that in there, and also I think that you know Tia did a great job of kind of getting us to know, getting us you know into Audrey's mind even more. Like she wasn't just there for jokes, like. You know, she saw what her mom goes through every day and she became kind of her caretaker and her her best friend, you know, just the two of them. So, like, really seeing how I don't know if she was deflecting by, like, analyzing everyone else around her, but just being able to see how, you know, she had to cope with her mom's illness and and really want to be her protector. Like, it just makes you love this girl even more and, you know, wish for the best for her. And also, like, you're kind of amazed how the two of them are able to, you know, work through life and like, you know, excel, like, okay, Audrey's like a A plus student and amazing, but she has real flaws too and and things that she needs to work on. Um, But as a kid, like, wow, she's more advanced and cooler than (laughs) any character I could think of. (laughs) Like, honestly, I wouldn't have been mad if we had more chapters with Audrey in it. Like, just her, like, inner dialogue is fantastic. Spot on. Yeah. Because she was, she was 12, right? Or was she? She's there? young. She's definitely yeah. Like she's not a teenager yet. Like she's a tween. I remember when her mom got mad oh, yeah, at her. Yeah, she's yeah. like, "You freaking tween!" <laughs> okay, it's perfect. I was gonna say like, how many people that age have the ability to like to think outside or like look outside themselves or even want to? You know what I mean? Like <sighs> yeah. her genuine care for her mom. Like so many. Like I'm not trying to fault tweens or teens. We've mm. all been there. They're very self self absorbed. You know what I mean? Like it's very yeah. you are the main character. Like you're not <laughs> worried about anyone else. And her, like you said, way of like looking out for her mom and trying to vet Shane and then their little budding relationship. Precious. I loved it. Yeah. Cause I'm even thinking back to like how I was as a tween. I was not like interested in my mom's, like my <laughs> mom and dad's relationship or like even my friends when like they would start having like boyfriends or girlfriends, I'd be like, that's weird. Why do you like him? Like, can we like go and do our nails or something? Like, like, yeah, like this is not. So yeah, her being just so like in tune with everything and, and observant. I mean, that was fantastic. And honestly, I think that even needed that. Like, Mm-hmm. again I think Eva in that time in her life was choosing what was safe and what, who wouldn't really you know try to get to know the real her and I think I loved having Audrey there to be able to see who Shane was and also see what he could do for her mom like I, I really did appreciate that there was someone to vet him for her because I mean to be honest Eva could have gone either way and I would have been happy either with either choice she made whether to keep with Shane or you know, to slam the door in his face. And then we just keep talking about Eve and, and Audrey throughout the rest of the book. So <laughs> I know. Like, can we get like a follow up just about Audrey and her life and yes. how she's doing? <laughs> oh my gosh. I would read that. So like a tiny little, like 
okay, how are her teens are going or whatever? And like, ha- does she have her practice open yet? Like how many patients does she have? And oh, and what if she wrote her own book? Like, oh my God, Audrey. Like kind of how her mom did, like, but like from her point of view? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That would be so cool. Oh my gosh. I'd read that immediately. Yeah. Like, can we just like kindly ask Tia Williams, like if you, if you have some spare time and you want to write a little novella from yeah. Audrey's perspective, be we're here we're waiting. Um, I kind of want to talk about, do you want to talk about Shane and Eva when they were in their teens or I guess just their relationship in general? Cause I feel like you can't talk about the past without also the present. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, we could talk about that. I mean, Tia wove it all together so beautifully too, but you, yeah, you kind of, I guess overall the way I describe a relationship is beautifully toxic. Like, and the thing is, is if I had only gotten the adult, side the perspective of Shane and Eva together I would have been more confused I think of like why are you guys so obsessed with each other but being able to get that background of their past as teens and you know how they both grew up with such hard past like Shane basically you know being an abandoned foster and foster kid and Jean Viev you know I love that like Mm -hmm. I was like Eva you should have kept that Jean Viev Mercy would have been really cute um but yeah just seeing how hard it was like her mom wasn't really a mom and she had to take care of herself from day one, basically. Um, And seeing how these two, you know, tortured souls find each other in seven days in June. I mean, the the romance there is just, it's too good. And also the things they went through, I mean, I feel like they were, they were just ready for the worst parts of life because the, 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 their young, their youth, was just so hard for them. Like, I, it's very interesting, like, how the way Tia really delved into, like, how hard their lives were as children. And so now, like, in the present, I guess, present tense, as they're adults and stuff, it makes sense how they would be drawn to each other again after, what was it, 15 years not being in each other's lives? Mm-hmm. Yeah, something about not only just falling back into what's old and comfortable, but also, like, there's so many unanswered questions um, between the two of them and, like, what happened? I mean, I'm assuming, of course, our listeners are going to have read this whole book. So, Oh, yeah. And we but, got a spoiler alert. So go ahead. Okay, perfect. The spoiler alert's in there. So, yeah, I'm just like, you know, after Shane just leaves her when she, um, when she's like a little teen um, after overdose, like I would be so hurt and scarred from that and so many questions. And so I don't blame Eva, adult Eva, for being curious when he just reappears in her life. Like I would want some answers for sure like what happened you know did you did you not love me anymore was it too much because I mean they were into some intense things like I like teen relationships are hard but having all that trauma and as well as drugs and you know her condition is still horrible from the get-go like she's having to pain is her life you know having to cope through all of that so him being that bright light and that love for her in those moments. Like I, I feel like he, he just was that hope in the darkness for her all over again. And, and them being as adults, I was rooting for it until it was kind of like, you saw that there were still issues like Shane, you know, I love Shane, but you're just trading addictions for one after the other. And I feel like he was more so just addicted to Eva than, in love with her. I think he truly does love her, but it's, it's hard to see what's clear about his love when he just has all these other things going on. And also, can we just talk about how they were like writing their books to each other? Oh my gosh. Yes. I know the iconic (laughs) line of the stop writing about me and you first. I know it's all over Instagram, but it is, it is around for a reason y'all because (laughs) damn. (laughs) Like that was the same I was listening to it on audio and that line came and I was like, oh, it's right. <laughs> it's like your heart starts like beating even harder. Like, oh my God, really? Oh my gosh. That was, that was the most rarely like book nerd moment of the century. Like, oh my yes, gosh. I love that. And, and yeah, I just want to like touch on what you said about them too. Cause I wanted to talk about the literary aspect of it. Mm. But their relationship, yeah, like I understand the draw and the connection of like, they are the first 
person that the other has met that they feel truly understands them. Mm -hmm. And I think like, you know, aren't we all looking for that? Like for someone who gets you and sees you wholly and completely and you don't have to feel embarrassed or ashamed. But like you said, it's like, it's just a, it's a little more complicated than that because like Shane, I think he is addicted to feeling good. Yes. And in his past, that was alcohol. And like you said, now it's Eva. And it just, because at first I was like, you're going to have to really sell me on how they could have been together for one week, 15 years ago. <laughs> and there's like, and like, you know, how was that love? Nice. And I don't, you know, I still don't know if that was necessarily love that they were in way back when, but I can understand now this like intense passion and need for the other. Yeah. Um, oh, and I want to talk about, I really appreciated the way that Tia Williams explored mental health for both of them. Cause I feel like I have not, there, it's, it's not very common. I mean, okay. Let me back up. It's becoming increasingly more common. I feel like not only for people to talk about it, but for it to be appearing in literature like this, but in like books with black protagonists, I have not seen that discussion happen very often. And so just like the way that mental health played a role and, the way, again, like when we're talking about the chronic pain, I feel like the way that she described what they were going through as teenagers also felt very, very, very realistic. Like, I completely understood why they felt the way they felt and how their backgrounds like played a role in <laughs> the behaviors that they were partaking in and their like desperate need to cling to each other um, when they were in high school. Like, that all checked out and and then, okay, let's fast forward back into the present. My biggest issue with their relationship, like, as it's happening in real time, is I feel like there's still a complete and utter lack of communication. And that really bothers me. Like, the when they got back together and they were at the party, everyone's all happy. They're like, yeah, we're going to go to the brunch tomorrow. And he just doesn't show up. How hard is it? To send a message. And I know he's like, he was in such a hurry, such a rush that he forgot. But to me, like, I got really annoyed at that part because it felt like drama just for drama's sake. And I was like, wait, what? Like, why? Why? I hate when people, like, when things can be solved by just simply communicating with each other. But once I got to the end of the book, I actually appreciated that happening because I don't think they should have been together at that point. I feel like they both internally still had a lot of work they needed to do on their own. And like you said, it's kind of a toss up on if they needed to get back together that soon at all, because she's, they even said like, or he said to her at the Liddy Awards, like, I'm not ready for this yet. I need to do a lot of work. And it was what, two or three months later that they ended up getting back together. How much work did you do <laughs> in that time? Yeah, honestly, it, it was, man, when he just dipped with out a single text or a smoke signal, anything. And knowing that Audrey, like that child like, even though she is so strong, like, she's still a child. Like, you, at the very least, you could have let her know somehow, like, you know, okay, I'm not going to, like, remember, there's a kid involved, too. Like, I'm not going to be able to make it on time because there's this other terrible tragedy. But I think that also Shane admits to himself, like, like, he has never had to be responsible for anyone besides himself in a very long time. And he was barely responsible for taking care of himself, like, the way he treated himself. And, you know, he was like, so many things are a blur for him because he was always just like on drugs or high or drunk and all that stuff. So him finally be able to have clarity and be in a relationship and, you know, get along with them. Like, I think it is so hard to break habits and forgetting about them and like it all going out the door because he was such in such pain mentally for, you know, thinking that he was responsible for this child's death or, and like him immediately just, self-tabotage like over and over in his brain like he he really has so much trauma to work on because again he you know your whole life has been this whole thing like you hating yourself and and drugging yourself to not feel things and you know now all of a sudden you're sober I I think this was really a realistic way that Tia wrote it um because just because Eva's back in your life doesn't mean everything you know goes to something beautiful and, you know, unicorns and Disney-fied, you know, like it sucked and it made me hate Shane, but it also made me see him as even more human because like mm -hmm. we can see like all the things he should have been doing. Right. But 
he just, it's hard to break the old habits. And, you know, even though he's a grown man now and he should have known better, um, he just, you know, he just still isn't able to get out of his own head. Um, and it's sad, uh, but I do appreciate how Eva was just so aware of the limitations that they had, you know, taking care of themselves, but also how like they weren't communicating and they, they weren't ready for a relationship. And I think that was really brave and strong of her to be able to admit that they have weaknesses and that they shouldn't be together. Cause I think like, even though Shane was like, yeah, I'm not ready for a relationship. But like, I think if Eva had pushed even more, he would have gone back and be like, you know what? Yeah. Let's just, let's stay together. We'll yeah, exactly. And work this out. So I feel like Eva was definitely the one here with the common sense. And I think also her being a mother kind of made that even more of a, like, you know, I have to choose me and my child before I, because I, because again, you can't fix anyone. They have to want to fix themselves. I was just going to say that. Like, you don't want to have to be in the business of changing somebody. Exactly. Like, yeah. And she's already, I don't want to say settled, but she's already done this once before. She's gotten with somebody who wasn't ready to be with her and she saw how that ended. And I appreciated that she recognized that a second time around. It was like, I'm not doing this again just because it feels good and just because it like the good is not going to outweigh the potential bad of if we rush into this too soon right yeah and you have to accept the bad with the good and you know there are some trade-offs that you have to make because you can't be happy all the time in a relationship but the whole like his immediate response is to just abandon and her trigger is being abandoned that's just so unhealthy for the two of them and I, I really appreciate that they were eventually both able to recognize that um but yeah it's like 2022 what was this book written 2020 21 like they, we have text messages mm-hmm. like even like i don't know a dm on instagram or something like yeah just there's been an emergency that's all that's i have to it. say you know what i'm saying yeah because the, the way that like we're so connected now like it's just like yeah I, I get your point like it there was some drama that had to happen I guess it was a lot <laughs> but it's like again it's like I think it's just showing how freaking toxic Shane is to himself and you know he you know he has this internal monologue like I always ruin everything you know for everyone else and so that was just his mo like I've done something horrible probably to make this kid go through all the pain he's gone through, which he didn't. Um, so of course I'm not worthy to even give Eva and Audrey a heads up that I won't be able to show up because he's thinking in his head, of course I wasn't going to be able to make it because something always bad happens because of me. And I always disappoint people. Yeah. I let them down and yeah. yeah, he is the king of self-sabotage. You were Seriously. <laughs> absolutely right about that. And that was the thing too, is like, I think, they needed to get to know each other as adults, yeah. you know, like they, they, they really didn't know each other that well. I mean, they, they've shared things that most people haven't with another person or like they got close really quickly because of their backgrounds and because of what happened to them 15 years before, but they didn't really know each other on like a base level And so I thought that whole scene or that sequence of them like texting while she was on her trip writing the book and kind of talking and just like actually talking like, how's your day? How are you doing? Joking around, like just becoming friends. I thought that was really sweet Um, and was like progress toward what they needed to work toward before committing to this relationship. I did think it was really sweet that Audrey, when she dropped off at the airport, she was like, I know he didn't show mom, but like hear him out or something like that. Like not even being hurt or angry, but just again, showing us how ridiculously observant she is. Yeah, that was, that was super sweet of Audrey. And she just really wants the best for her mom. And she saw the good in Shane. And I think the fact that he was trying, you know, um, I wish the communication has happened earlier, but again, these are two like people who, you know, with Eva being touch starved and Shane just going through life, not wanting to, get close to anyone, you know, emotionally and physically, like as long as, as soon as they met, like, I feel like the feelings and the, the physical like touch and everything was so much more powerful. They felt like, I don't need to communicate. I know who this person Mm -hmm. was. And, you know, what I'm feeling now is something that they both were desperately needing and they were both starved for. So the whole, like, it was, it was just like, you know, a spark igniting as soon as they met. Like, it's just like, 
uh, I don't blame you for not like getting to know like, hey, how's the, you know, past traumas, how you've been dealing with all those, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, how are you, what are your coping mechanisms these <laughs> what days? What have you been like, up to? It's like, no, this is hot. Like, let's go. Like, let's go for it. And it's e- like, you know what I mean? I think it's easy to fall into lust yes, and passion. Like very easy. everyone, like people are human. And when things feel good, it's like easy to give in to that. And I can see like why they were kind of blinded by that at first, but that will burn off eventually. And you know, what are you going to be left with? Yeah. And I think like you're saying, that's what they're maybe we're starting to realize at the Lydia awards. Mm-hmm. Like we can't live in this little perfect, you know, sexy, happy bubble because that's going to dissipate. And then what, what what will this be for us? What does this mean for us? What we're doing here, and just coming to terms like with you know th- there are um, we're in the real world unfortunately, <laughs> and so just realizing like we have a lot of things we need to work on and figure out. I um I did want to touch on I loved the like literary aspect of this book like them both being writers the Liddy Awards I wish I was there that was so cool like the first moment when they like just locked eyes like oh my gosh that was beautiful that was like you felt it in your bones yeah you know you're like okay something really big is about to happen and everyone else sensing it in the room too oh my gosh that was great so good and then like everyone being like oh my god their tattoos the tattoos match <laughs> when like all the fans are able to just like start like getting all the clues together I'm like oh my god the fan fiction is going to be insane like in the real world after that oh my gosh yeah um some of the characters too like the panel like the, the one we we're talking about where they first showed up i cannot remember his name but the guy the, the guy who was in the panel <laughs> i was dying at how she wrote him hilarious because we all so, know somebody like that yes yeah he was i mean he was like yeah i'm just gonna you know dominate this whole thing and you know black man yeah da, da, da. i'm like what you're doing is cute but it's not it's not important for the culture and i was like <laughs> oh my god like everyone knows this guy and oh my gosh you appreciate it but i really appreciate it when shane was just a look put him Sh- down shut like, it down yes we're not go- my brother like no <laughs> <laughs> the other girl on the panel too i cannot remember who it was but she her response is she said something to him like so do you care about black women or just black men where you're at <laughs> she was <laughs> awesome she was awesome <laughs> that was amazing she was like even like friend too wasn't she or was it her the the one who does poetry i think or like there was an agent there too Um, oh yeah 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 the one who that was yeah 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 and it was just like amazing like having the having the two of them you know battle him while you know eva's just melting in her seat basically um but i do appreciate when eva was finally able to just be like you know what i have so much to get off my chest about you shane that like the rest of the panel sit back eat the popcorn watch it's gonna, gonna go down and everyone's just like <laughs> watching this like <laughs> verbal tennis match essentially between the two of them it was hot though like that's what you like kind of imagine between writers and famous you know successful writers and mm-hmm. the way that they've been you know writing stuff although um i i have a i have so many bones to pick with shane but the fact that he was basically plagiarizing eva's life for his books and his success i i mm, and the, I, the most intimate moments of her life too yeah you know? very private and i get that he was trying to speak to her but it's also like you're using the worst parts of me that, you know, that she's been hiding. I mean, she changed her name and everything and moved for God's sake, you know, like that was part of her. She went to leave behind and the fact that he was able to profit off of that and, and be so famous and then not wanting the fame. Like it's just, Tia writes some complicated characters. She does. And I was going to say, and be infinitely, I don't even want to say like fame is the most important thing here, but the kind of recognition that he's getting, the kind of awards he's receiving yes. and the way people speak about him and his work compared mm-hmm. to Eva and her work, but it's her life that he, everyone's like, he's this literary genius and he's a once in a generation writer. And it's like, y'all are pe- like <sighs> passing Eva off as just some like, oh, she's just some romance writer. But that yeah. is her story. Yeah, that. yeah, and I love that she kind of reclaimed it at the mm-hmm. end, like in writing about her family, that full circle moment. I really oh appreciated gosh. that. Oh, her mom, mm. real piece of work. 
Um, okay, the audiobook did an amazing job. Perfect, with the so good. I loved it. I was just like, it's syrupy sweet. And oh my gosh, she's a wildcat. Like this woman, like so many bad decisions, but she's just so fun to listen to and try to understand like how does Eva come from this? It's like, they're so totally different people, but oh my gosh, her mom is the piece of work. She really sure. is. And if, if y'all are listening to this and you have not read the book somehow, some way, I would definitely recommend an audiobook because yeah, it just, it just, it gives a whole new layer to the experience. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so I highly recommend if you can to listen to the audiobook. It's funny actually, cause, um, Nobody's Magic is another one that I'm doing this season. And I listen to the audiobooks around the same time. And the same narrator for Eva narrates one of the characters in Nobody's Magic. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Okay, I'm going to have to put that on my TBR. Because I'm listening <laughs> and I'm like, hold on, her voice sounds really, really familiar. And so I like went and looked it up and yeah, it was her. I was like, oh, that's cool. And she also like has a Southern accent. So um, yeah. So yeah, if y'all haven't listened to Nobody's Magic, or have, yeah, if you haven't listened to Nobody's Magic or read that yet, I highly recommend doing that on audio as well. Um, but back to Seven Days. I'm looking at my notes trying to see if there was anything else I wanted to discuss that we haven't gotten to. Oh, do we want to talk about how Shane was kind of like a big brother? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I... I appreciated what he was doing in the sense of like, he knows exactly what it's like to feel like mm. there's nobody there for you. And like it, it broke my heart thinking about Shane's childhood. It really did. And the guilt he carries from like what happened to his foster mom and then everything that has happened in his life since then. And so I thought it was really sweet that he told these kids, like, no matter where I am, no matter what time it is, like, I'll be there for you. And he was essentially what happened with Ty was heartbreaking. Like I kind of wish I know there had to be a catalyst to kind of trigger his old behavior of running away or self-sabotaging, but Ty dying was really hard to stomach. That was intense. Like, I honestly thought I was just going to be a coma and then maybe wake up and then, you know, Ty'd be, you know, going on that date with that girl and becoming like a famous planetarium scientist or something later. That was, yeah, that was truly sad. And I think that trigger of going back to like how Shane left Eva, you know, when she was overdosing as a, a teen and, and his mom or her mom, excuse me, um, you know, getting him arrested and locked up away. I think him wanting to always be a, available for those kids and just like always there. I think it probably stems from that past trauma of not being able to be there for Eva when she really, really, really needed him. Mm -hmm. So Maybe that was why he like really got to the you know big brother type of thing, or just going to the worst schools and trying to find those at risk youth and and really just trying to steer them on the right path. Um, and to be honest, I'm actually surprised that Shane did like go back and um, you know but after you know Ty's passing, I was surprised that he did like contact Eva again and and try to like apologize and stuff because I felt it was just like it was so intense because he might have seen you know a flashback of Eva you know being passed out he didn't know if she died you know back then like the fact that Ty did he could have just reinvented the wheel in his head and being like oh my god like this is my fault too and I need to stay far away from her I need to stay far away yeah because now there's a child involved Audrey you know and the fact that he thinks that he can make someone die like he thinks that he's that bad that he has those effects on people like i'm very surprised that he went back and like i want to try to be friends and i want to apologize and all that like that was intense i don't know if i could get over that either actually yeah it was and i just again like i wasn't expecting that <laughs> to come from the book and like as we're talking about it you know I, I was really frustrated with Shane's lack of communication I even said it earlier in this episode like it was annoying or frustrating to me it was really annoying when I was reading the book but like I didn't even think about it the way that you just phrased it in that it's triggering for him probably it probably reminds him exactly of what happened before with Ava and I can completely understand now why he kind of 
tried to remove himself. I mean, he came back to explain, but that moment where he's like, I know I can't do this. And she's like, I know that all makes much more sense if he's relating it to what happened before. Mm -hmm. Um, I just thought of something while you're talking to the novella we get could be Shane being the teacher at Audrey's school. Oh my God. Yes. I forgot about that. Yes. (laughs) Like her talking about him teaching there and like, how, how, how's that all going? Cause I think that is going to be really great. And I'm looking forward. Well, we, I was looking forward to it when the book ended because I think he does make a great teacher for like, I think that's a great profession for him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And he genuinely think, cares. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was like, I'm, I think it was great because it's, it's structured versus him just like popping up in a school and just trying to like help a kid and like have their, you know, text him at all times and hours. Like I think him being able to be in the classroom and constantly mold all those minds over it, it could be good for him. Um, but the whole him just like being a rogue mentor, like he's just, that's not the best way to, like, I think he's trying to still conquer his own demons through helping these kids, you know? So I, I forgot about him being the substitute teacher because, or going to be the substitute teacher at Audrey's uh, place. Cause that was like the point of like, everything's perfect and happy and like, yay, seven days in June is so cute. And then everything- he'll be together and he'll teach and her daughter <laughs> loves him. And yeah. And then, cause like, it got to that point, like they're at the, the party that her, um, her friend slash editor is throwing. Yes. And I was like, they're so happy. They're going public with their relationship. And I was yeah. like, hold up. There's like 40 ish, 50 ish pages of the book left. <laughs> What's going to happen? And then I was like, of course, it couldn't be all peach keen roses, sunshine, unicorns. And like, I know that's not realistic. Like, you're right. Like, it, it couldn't have ended that way because there's way too many unanswered questions. And I think it goes right back to what I was saying at the beginning of the episode that they used each other to like b- put a band aid on their pain, essentially. And like, that's just never going to work because the pain is still there. And yeah, that would have just been, I think. A highly unrealistic ending for an otherwise very realistic story but it was just it was painful <laughs> yeah like i and i appreciate that she didn't just end on such a happy note like she kind of just gave us a glance of what it could be but sorry reality still has to come in and you know there's still so many things that they have to deal with um and honestly it's it's one of the more when I think of the books that I read that are romance, you know, it's one of the more greater fleshed out types of, you know, analysis on what a relationship is. Because I think, you know, in society, we always think, okay, you date and then you get married, you have the kids and you're happy and da, 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 that's it. But there's not many books that really discuss and delve into like the hard parts and, you know, like, why should we be together? And like, what's, you know, things that I have to work through you have to work through and how do we communicate and work through them together or how do we, you know, like they are very mature about this, realizing that there are some things that we have to do apart and figure out how we are as, you know, individual people. Cause I, you know, like RuPaul says, you know, if you can't love yourself, then how the hell are you going to love somebody else? (laughs) (laughs) It's so true. And I feel like people think like, cause like you're right in movies and books, generally when it's romance, it doesn't show the kind of grittier aspects of it. Cause I feel like people, I don't know if they think it doesn't sell or it's not as appealing, but I think we should be talking about that because Mm -hmm. I think that the opposite gives people very unrealistic expectations about relationships. Like when it's not sunshine, unicorn rainbows, people are like, Oh, it's too hard. Or, you know, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And it's like committing your life to another person, whether that be marrying them or just being together, sharing your life with someone is messy. It's difficult. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like both people have to be prepared to prepared and willing to work through whatever comes up. Yeah. And so like, yeah, yeah, oh God, I was just saying, I like that she gave us that. We got finally see an example of that. Seriously, yeah, because I, th- I think it's almost tradition to write that feel good love story. When you think of romance, you think, you know, it's really, you know, beautiful and sunshine, or it's like it's really hot, like sex and okay, unrealistic is whatever, like um, 50 Shades of Grey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no shade. I, I read all the books and, you know, watched all the movies, but, you know, it's not real. And I think that, you know, now that things have gotten so intensely real in reality, you know, with the pandemic and all of us having to reassess our own lives and stuff, I think it's great that we're able to talk about these things, you know, mental health issues and drug-related issues and, you know, just the things that 
we actually, you know, are failing and coping with every day and being able to actually, you know, it's also like how now you're seeing so many stories that feature people of color in as the main characters, not just the supporting characters or the like, you know, the best friend with the jokes, or whatever, like being able to see ourselves fully um, with all of our, you know, you know, our the bad parts of us and the the parts that we don't generally, you know, present in public or on Instagram or Facebook, you know, it's like, no, this is a real human experience um, that's fully realized in this book. And I, I think that's wonderful that, you know, there are more authors out there like Tia Williams that are doing this. Um, yeah. And also, is she having a movie? Uh, I think so. Out about this? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm like, oh I'm ready gosh. and waiting. I kind of want it to so be excited. I'm I'm more of a fan. I like when adaptations are miniseries instead of movies. Cause like for a book, there's just such there's so many little details that I feel like sometimes sometimes in a movie it just is too rushed. So yes. hit us with like a six yeah. episode miniseries. Perfect. Here for it. Can't wait. But yeah, I think you're right. I think it's coming to Netflix if I'm I honest. would not mind if it was on Netflix. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Cause I'm thinking of like the movie adaptations like Harry Potter, I remember being so pissed about so many scenes that were just completely erased because there's not enough time. And there is a way yeah. you have to translate the text to the visual. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to keep in, but yeah. Oh my gosh. A mini series would be great. Yes. I just feel like for, if you're going book adaptation, you got to go mini series. Like little fire. Mm, I have my own. If y'all want my opinions on the little fires every adaptation, you can listen to our episode on it. <laughs> um, Cause like, I love that they made it a show. There were some changes made that I have a couple of questions on. I just want to talk. That's it. But um, all in all, like it was, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. I liked the book better, but yeah. Um, I was going to say actually, cause thinking about another series that was adapted or another book that was adapted to a series was Normal People, which I feel like they did amazing on, like so, so good. But when we were talking about their relationship and how this book is a little bit of a more accurate portrayal of like the, of all aspects of a relationship, I really like that we're also starting to challenge this idea or this notion that people have to be together at all costs. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's another kind of romance trope is even if they're not totally good for each other or right for each other or whatever it may be, everyone's still always rooting for them to be together. And that's what I liked about normal people is like they spoiler. So maybe skip ahead a minute. If you haven't listened to it, or, have you read it or listened to it? I actually haven't. Okay, no, but I'm I was just like, <laughs> let me stop. <laughs> let me stop. Cause I haven't said anything like crazy yet, but I was okay. going to go into like the ending. I will pause. And then after you, if you read it ever, um, message me. <laughs> I'll yeah. tell you my thoughts on that. But um, it's just another very accurate portrayal, I think, of a relationship in the good and the bad. And that's what yeah. I really loved about it. So highly recommend. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to say about the book? I'm realizing we're coming up on time here. Oh, my gosh. There's so many things. Ah, and no pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just like thinking of like the perfect thing to end with, but <laughs> we usually just end on a like, would you recommend? But I feel like obviously, you yes. know, <laughs> I am a huge fan of this book. I'm a huge fan of Tia Williams. Like I'm looking to the other works that, you know, she's written too. Um, oh my gosh. I think, wow. You know what? I, I think I can't. Okay. Actually, let me not say that. I was going to say, I, I don't think I can stomach like, the regular romance novels anymore after this where everything's happy like <laughs> looking for conflict. I need more <laughs> <laughs> like this is definitely one of those books for people who think that they hate romance and that they're not romance readers I think this is a beautiful representation of what romance can be and um what it really kind of is in real life because even the, the most like happiest couples you see you know stuff happens behind the closed doors you know maybe not as toxic as this hopefully not as toxic as this book um but i think this is a awesome book that everyone should use the audiobook for um libro fm like you know support your local bookstores um and yeah, I, I highly recommend this book. I just, I love this uh, so much. And I actually, I keep going back and forth if I want Shane and Eva to stay together and have more babies, or if I just want Eva to do her own badass thing and, you know, conquer the world 
and write what she actually wants to write. I actually thought that was beautiful too. Like her she's being able to, yeah, she's herself and break free from what people expect of her, what her fans expected of her, you know, and actually be herself. Like that was, I think that's what the most powerful messages that came from this book, you know, like love yourself, choose yourself. Like it might be a hot, hot man waiting in the wings, but you know, you know, I love how she began with like literally how this book begins with her choking from her. Uh, <laughs> yes. I was like, that is a hell of a, of an opening. Okay. That like pulled me in immediately. I was like, yes, girl. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, once you, once you get all that out, you know, choose yourself. Okay. Like, I think they might be better suited as friends, good friends. I think so. And I think that's okay. That's yeah. really, that's really okay. And I think that's, actually a kind of friend that she does need because you know when she came to new york she had a totally different persona she wanted to hide everything about her past and having shane there someone who really knows her from the beginning um and wants her to open up and be herself i think that's awesome um so i'm fine with them staying as friends and i'm also fine with them growing and communicating as lovers Taking it step by step. I completely agree. So like, yeah, y'all, I mean, if you've gotten to this point of the episode, I think, you know, we recommend it. Um, it will, it will blow you away. And like, it, it will like just shatter expectations. Cause that's definitely what it did for me. And it's one of the few instances of a book living up to the hype. So rush out, audiobook it. And then let us know your thoughts as usual on Instagram or Discord or wherever it suits your fancy to chat with us. Um, go ahead and follow Liz. I'm going to have all of her information in our show notes. So you can go to her Instagram, check it out. It's great. Thank you so much again for joining. I'm so happy that we got to do this book in particular because I know how much you enjoyed it. And it was just so nice to talk about it with someone yeah. else who appreciates it. Oh my gosh, I love geeking out about it with you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course.